You know, that age-old adage, damned if you do and damned if you don't, well, this can be applied here perfectly, and you'll see in a moment exactly why that is. Professors say classroom civility promotes white racial power. To go on, that sounds rather fascinating from the perspective of someone who enjoys a good train wreck from time to time, and I can say that as someone who has actually been in a train accident before. In a recent academic journal article, two University of Northern Iowa professors blessed the prevalence of whiteness-informed civility in college classrooms, saying that civil behavior reinforces white racial power. Keep what I've just read in mind for the next point that you're going to get thrown at you in the very same article. They say that endeavoring to treat everyone the same, regardless of race, for instance, functions to erase racial identity in the attempt to impose a race evasive frame on race talk. Race, 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 race. Every single time that race is mentioned within this video, you should feel free to take a drink. How about that? Let's do the same for white, because I have a feeling. So let me get this straight. In treating everyone the same, you're effectively erasing racial identity, which somehow reinforces white racial power. Am I getting that right? You are effectively erasing racial identity whilst simultaneously reinforcing racial identity. Do you see my issue here? Two University of Northern Iowa professors recently argued that practicing civility in college classrooms can reproduce white racial power. See Kyle Rodrick and Catherine B. Golson assert in a recent academic article that I'd have to pay some 40-odd monies to actually look at despite having a university student account. Civility, particularly whiteness-informed civility, allegedly functions to assert control of space and create a good white identity. What pray tell is whiteness-informed civility? I'm just curious. What, what am I doing specifically that is a wrong behavior. Tell me, oh, wise people love race relations so that I may correct my wrong think adequately enough for your liking? The civility can reinforce white privilege, Rudick and Goslin argue, because civility within higher education is racialized. Oh. Oh. <laughs> You're gonna need some heavy-handed evidence to actually back up that claim. Just saying. Rather than universal norm, according to the field of critical whiteness studies. That's a fucking field. An offshoot of critical race theory, theorists of critical whiteness studies seek to examine the construction and moral implications of whiteness. There is a great deal of overlap between critical whiteness studies and critical race theory, as demonstrated by focus on the legal and historical construction of white identity and the use of narratives, whether legal discourse, testimony, or fiction, as a tool for exposing systems of racial power. Thank you, Wikipedia. Just curious, but what are the moral implications of whiteness? And while you're at it, ditto for the rest of the races. I want to know exactly what the moral implications of blackness are, and Asians, and so on, because we're all about diversity here right? Not, not because I actually give a fuck, but I'd like to hear you argue just exactly how using race's historical context, for example, the rape of Nanking, or say the Africans who sold their fellow Africans into slavery, you would seek to erect and reconcile a monolithic moral standard amongst the races. To study this phenomenon, Rudick and Goslin interviewed 10 white college students and asked them questions such as, what do you consider to be civil behavior, and how do you think your racial identity may affect your understandings of civility when talking with students of color? Guided questioning much? <laughs> your representative sample size for the monolith of white civility and racial power is a uh, whopping 10 college students. 10. That's, I can count that on my hands. Both of them, you see? Right here. You know, in drug trials, before we even begin to think about even producing substances for the use of the general public, they go through test runs and samplings in groups of varying sizes in varying quadrants of the world with more than 10 freaking college students. But, you know, what do I know? And I think if you're going to even think about making such a bombastic melodramatic claim based on not a field, no, a theory, and put it out there as evidence that this behavior promotes white racial power, you're going to need a hell of a lot more than 10 subjects to make such an assertion of an entire 
demographic. You call this a study? This is, this is less legitimacy than any Twitter poll that I've ever put out. Students who indicated that they treat everyone the same way were accused of trying to create a good white identity, according to Rudy and Gosselin's analysis. Would you rather them not treat everyone equally? Because that's been done before in this country. There was a certain movement that resulted because of it, uh, what was it called? The uh, Civil Rights Movement. What's wrong with treating everyone the same, honestly? I, I really want to know. Being civil with both people, what's wrong with that? With, with being civil to people equally? Do, do you want to know what happens when people aren't civil with each other? Because this is exactly how you find that out. First, participants stated that they tried to avoid talking about race or racism with students of color to minimize the chances that they would say something wrong and be labeled a racist, the professors report. Well, that's fucking stupid, but I mean, isn't self-censorship the new First Amendment for people nowadays? Come on, get with the times. Another way that participants describe how they tried to be civil when interacting with students of color was to be overly nice or polite. Sounds like some grade A self-cuckery, but when one could possibly be on the receiving end of an academic in inquisition, a Twitter storm of buttfuckery, or just general protests and riots for their thoughts, it's no wonder people might tend to be over polite to others. While students who make an extra effort to be nice to students of color, Rudrick and Gosselin claim, are merely upholding white privilege and white racial power. Yeah, you still have yet to connect those two dots for me, but you know, that's fine. I will wait. I'm very patient like that. Even students who indicate that they treat everyone the same were accused of reinforcing white racial power by the professors who contend that treating everyone the same in the spirit of colorblindness can actually be a race evasive strategy. Race evasive? M meaning what? Meaning m maybe they'd rather not open up that proverbial can of worms because they literally cannot win in any sense of the word in any case, even when they are trying to be sensitive to the topic of race and perhaps being conscientious not to trigger anyone. They are in fact accused in, in, in doing this, they are in fact accused of reinforcing white power. What? In this vein, one interviewee, Ryan, stated, I feel like I treat everyone the same. To me, if you're white or black, then I'm going to treat you like a human being. I guess I don't see skin color whenever I see someone. Criticizing this colorblind strategy, Rudick and Goslin argued that it functions to erase racial identity in the attempt to impose a race evasive frame on race talk. How does treating people as if they're human erase their racial identity? Seriously though, let's be real, if your racial identity, or if your race, if your identity in itself, which, by the way, is a ridiculous sentiment to hold, as members and cultures within the respective races across the board are not a monolith, if your race and your race identity, if your identity can be erased simply because someone is not taking extra care to acknowledge it in their interactions with you, then perhaps it's not that big of a deal. But you still have yet to explain how exactly this occurs, and that's, that's, that's where I was kind of hoping to get you. To fight this, Riddick and Gosselin argue that college professors must intervene, saying, it is incumbent upon instructors to ensure that their classrooms are spaces that challenge rather than perpetuate whiteness informed civility. So what does that look like exactly? Is it instead of not being civil with everyone across the board, you drop kick them into next Monday? protest outside their classrooms, only allow certain people with certain perspectives to speak or take up a space, because that's happened to me before. One way that instructors can challenge the strategies of whiteness-informed civility is by ensuring the white students and students of color engage in sustained, sensitive, and substantive conversations about race and racism, they suggest. Okay, we do that. Everyone in the United States goes to public school, learns the history of race relations and the history of the United States. Not to mention, in order to graduate from my university, I don't know about other universities, but I and everyone else in my school that are not in the School of Music have to fulfill a requirement for power, privilege, and diversity. So, next issue, please. Riddick and Gosselin also say that professors should encourage white students to understand how using whiteness informed civility to downplay issues of race or racism in higher education serves to elide their own social location and reinforce the hegemony of white institutional presence. You know, I may be a lowly sophomore in a university learning about computer science and psychology, but I can tell when someone is regurgitating nonsense. But you know, I'm a masochist. I'm taking Greek after all. Let's, let's go ahead and decipher this academic ivory tower nonsense so that the layman can understand what it is that we're getting at. 
encourage white students to understand how using white informed civility to downplay issues of race or racism in higher education serves to elide their own social location and reinforce the hegemony of white institutional presence. We still don't know exactly what they mean when they say white informed civility. So, in essence, I took the liberty of reading the abstract of the study, which has defined exactly what white inf whiteness informed civility is understood as by the researchers. Abstract. In this study, the authors draw upon critical whiteness studies to explore how white students' understanding of race talk within higher education reproduces whiteness. I would like if they further defined whiteness, but that's okay, I'll do it for them. The closest I could get is whiteness studies, which I didn't know was a thing, but um, I guess it is. Whiteness studies is an interdisciplinary area of inquiry that has developed beginning in the United States, particularly since the late 20th century, it has focused on what proponents describe as the cultural, historical, and sociological aspects of people identified as white, and the social construction of whiteness as an ideology tied to social status. Which is again a rather broad stance to take, not all white people are a monolith. I mean, we have Germans, we have the English, we have the French, and various other nations who are all separately identified with their own kin. I mean, you wouldn't hold the Polish responsible for Japanese internment in the US by virtue of being white, would you? No, of course not, that would be silly, just like you wouldn't hold the Chinese responsible for the Russian massacre of the Polish citizens in the Kenya massacre, simply by virtue of both groups being in Asia. And that's the whole problem with taking a racial demographic and analyzing historically. Culturally and sociologically, races are not a monolith, not by any stretch of the imagination. Not in the slightest. You are being disingenuous, but let's get to the definition of whiteness informed civility. Through an analysis of interview data, they generated three categories describing whiteness informed civility. A. Whiteness wick functions to create a good white identity, or perhaps, maybe, just establish a good rapport with people that they deal with on a daily basis. Not everyone is representative of a collective, least of all 10 college students, mind you. B. WIC functions to erase racial identity. And you have yet to explain how that occurs, but do go on. C. WIC functions to assert control of space. Now this one is rather interesting because that is in fact what this boils down to, isn't it? Control. If someone happens to have control over themselves in a conversation in everyday life, then do you know what that means? That means that someone else doesn't have control over them, namely a professor with a greater socio-political agenda at hand. You are giving these people, civil whites, a lot more credit than I feel they deserve, to be honest. Not only are they saying that the act of a single person engaged civilly creates a good identity for the entire monolith of white identity that you're trying to produce out of this critical whiteness race theory bullshittery, but you are saying that it effectively erases other racial identities whilst simultaneously asserting control of a space. A space in which presumably there are other members of other groups, ethnic and otherwise, who possess their own will, beliefs, and autonomy. How strange. But, you know, it's fine. Let's finish the abstract. These thematic concepts show how WIC is characterized by logics of race evasion, avoidance of race talk, and exclusion of people of color. The authors conclude by offering ways for instructors to inter interrogate? Okay. <laughs> to interrogate whiteness informed civility through classroom practices informed by critical communication pedagogy. Sounds like a, a bunch of hullabaloo to me, to be honest, but in essence it boils down to this. Certain peoples of certain demographics' way of communicating and engaging in discourse is unsatisfactory, and it all boils down to essentially the historical, cultural, and socioeconomic implications of their skin color. Yes. Rudrick told Campus Reform by email that he wrote the article in the spirit of his continued service to Cthulhu, so knowing that, I'm not sure how seriously I can take this, but did not respond to follow-up inquiries. Goslin did not respond at all. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider checking out the Patreon, Maker, Amazon, and Teespring links in the description of this video. If you like me, but not necessarily that much, no worries. Maybe hit the like button, subscribe, comment if you got something to say, and share, because every share helps. 
Thank you. Have a good new year. Thank you.